Hey, I'm Thomas, and we're doing this kind of on short notice, so um, I'm going to do it in English. I hope that's okay. But I think we have a cool topic for you today. We're going to look at inclusion and exclusion again. But we're going to look at it a little bit differently from last week, and this, I think, gives us some new insights. And this is actually something I worked on when I was doing my PhD in Utrecht. Oh, I mean, wow, that's... That's 10 years ago now. I didn't even realize. Well, anyway, so I was involved in, in some of this together with Jesper Nederlof and uh, Johan van Roy. In terms of what we used it for, we actually worked on dominating set, which we will not talk about today. But the idea is that you can actually look at inclusion-exclusion as if it's a branching algorithm. Last week it looked like something completely different, but you can look at it in very similar ways, which then allows you to combine branching techniques with inclusion-exclusion techniques. We'll see some of that in a later lecture. And we'll be able to apply a measure-and-conquer analysis to an inclusion-exclusion type branching algorithm. And what I mean by that is what we'll talk about today. So let's start with some old and some new notation. We have a universe of items, U, and we have a set of properties, P. And then, as before, for some subset S of the properties, N of S is the cardinality, the number of elements in the universe, such that this element has all the properties in S. This is the same as last time. And then, also last time, we had this thing, N bar, which is the number of elements in the universe such that E satisfies none of the properties of S. So the two things that we already had was, for a set of properties, how many things have all of these, and how many things have none of these. And in a moment, we're going to be a little bit more precise than that. But first, let's recall what we had. Last week, we had the theorem that these two things relate through the inclusion-exclusion theorem, which says that n of p equals the sum over all of the subsets of n bar of s, where each of these terms is either positive or negative, depending on the cardinality of the subset. And why would you ever do this? Why would I want to relate something that I want into exponentially many other things to calculate. That's an exponential blow up. How is this going to help me? This is going to be terrible. Well, maybe n bar of s is easier to calculate than n of p. And the algorithm design challenge is recognizing situations where this is the case. I guess this problem where you look at it from the other direction is always called the simplified problem, but that's because you would only do it if it's actually simpler. Let's practice. Let's look at a problem where a bunch of things need to all be true, but it's hard to make them all true at the same time. And then we'll reduce it to simplified problems where a bunch of things have to be not true at the same time. You'll recall that the ST Hamilton path problem is the following. I get an undirected graph. I get nodes S and T. And now I'm asked, is there a path? from S to T that visits precisely all of the vertices exactly once. To me, that definitely sounds like the first kind of thing. I have a bunch of properties and I want all of them to be true, but that's hard. As you know, the Hamilton path problem is NP-hard. Now, I want you to think for a second about the following question. If we want to do this kind of inclusion-exclusion trick, if we want to use the inclusion-exclusion theorem, we need a universe and we need properties. So now I would like you to think about that for a second. So just pause the video and try to come up with it on your own. I don't really need an algorithm at this point, but just what is the universe? What are the properties? There are a number of ways to do this and some of them are going to work out, some of them aren't. Um, here's one that ends up working, and we can talk about it in the chat room during the, the lecture time slot. I'm going to do it like this. As our universe, we will take all st walks of length n. In case you didn't know, in English there is a difference between walks in a graph and paths in a graph. 
if I'm not mistaken, in German, the distinction is weg and fat. And the thing is, if you make the distinction, then usually what you mean is that a path is not allowed to use the same vertex more than once. And a walk is. A walk can just go to a vertex and immediately come back to the vertex again, or it can cross over itself. But a path, if you make the distinction, is not allowed to do that. Sometimes the literature also says simple path, if they mean a path that doesn't use the same vertex more than once. But in this lecture, we will take the distinction path, which is simple, and walk, which is allowed to be non-simple. So here we fix that the thing has the correct length, that it starts in the correct place, and that it ends in the correct place. But we don't care whatsoever where it goes. And then we have a property for every vertex. And the property says the walk comes through this vertex. Now, the thing that we're actually interested in is whether there is a path that goes through all vertices. So if there is an element in our universe that has all of the properties. So that's n of p in the above notation. To be slightly more precise, n of p is actually the number of elements that has these properties, so the number of walks. And this is kind of important. We need to count things in order to be able to do inclusion-exclusion. So now rather than calculate n of p, we can take a sum with exponentially many terms of n bar of s. So is this actually simpler? What is the simplified problem in this case? Think about it. You get a subset of the properties. So a subset of the vertices, really. And then none of these properties are allowed to hold. So you get a set of vertices, and now you need to count the number of st walks of length n that do not go to these vertices. My claim, this problem is actually simplified. This is something that's easier to calculate. This problem is actually polynomial time solvable. I haven't looked at the exercise sheet yet. Maybe this is going to be a question. But if it's not, we can talk about this in the chat at the lecture. Given an undirected graph and a set of vertices that you're not allowed to go to, how many ST walks are there? Solving that in polynomial time will give you an O star of 2 to the n time algorithm for the ST Hamilton path problem. We already had a dynamic programming algorithm for Hamilton Path, actually for the traveling salesman problem. But it also uses exponential space for its dynamic programming table. And this one doesn't need that. This one just works in polynomial space, which is an advantage. But as you'll notice, there are no weights here. We cannot simply use this to solve the traveling salesman problem. Because if you look at this statement, where would the weights even go? Inclusion-exclusion tends to have a problem with weights, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But for now, we'll just have noticed that we can actually do an inclusion-exclusion problem for something else than coloring. And even this very simple version gives us something that we didn't have before. An O star of 2 to the n time algorithm with polynomial space. Let's go back to definitions and notation. We already had n of s, which is, satisfies all the properties. And we had n bar of s, which is, satisfies none of the properties. Now we're going to be a little bit more precise about that, and we will introduce three more sets, and we'll call them R, F, and O. And that stands for required, forbidden, and optional. And as you can see, this is the definition. n of R, F, and O is the cardinality of the set of all elements in the universe, such that this element E satisfies all of the properties in R and none of the properties in F. You'll notice that O doesn't appear in this definition, and that's precisely because the elements in O are optional. We don't actually care if they are true or not. Required needs to be true, forbidden needs to be not true, and O we don't actually care about. And this notation with R, F, and O is actually a generalization of the previous notation. So if I have some subset S of all of the properties, then how do I express the old N of S in terms of N 
of R, F, and O. What do I need to set R, F, and O to to get N of S? I'll give you one more second to think. And the answer is, well, for N of S, these properties in S need to all be true. So for my set R, for my set of required properties, I need S. None of the properties are forbidden, so F is the empty set. And the rest of the properties I don't care about, they are optional. So the set O, I put in all of the properties except S. So the old N of S equals our new N of S empty set P minus S. How do I get the old N bar of S? Well, that's actually simple now. It's N of empty set S and P minus S. Now I have both the old N and the old N bar in a new generalized notation system. And now we can play around with it. This cup with a dot in it is notation for the disjoint union. So these four sets are not allowed to overlap and together they are P. So what I'm actually saying is I want to take all of the properties and partition them into non-overlapping sets R, F, O, and one more special item P. And now my claim is the following. I can kind of move this property P around between these sets. So let's say that originally it is an optional property. So on the left, I have R, F, and O union P. And now my claim is that this is equal to N R union P F O plus N R F union P O. And what I'm basically saying, this is kind of branching like we did before. What I'm saying is if a certain property is optional, then how many elements of the universe am I supposed to count? Well, these elements either have the property or they do not. And if P is optional, I have to add both of these. So let's just do that. This is very simple. That's what it says. The number of elements, if I don't care about this property, is the number of elements that have this property plus the number of elements that explicitly do not have this property. This is the principle that we used in our very first branching algorithm where we were counting independent sets. I take this vertex, I don't know if it's in the independent set or not, so I branch in either taking it or not taking it. I count in both of the branches and then I add this number and then it works out. If this was just obvious, then why did we even do this? What have we won? Well, we have this expression now, which we can just start shuffling around. Let's pull the term where we make P required to the left, and then we get this formula, which we called required equals optional minus forbidden, because that's kind of what it says over there. The number of elements in the universe that have the properties R and P, and not the properties F, equals the following. The number of elements that have R and not F, and I don't care about P, but that counts too much. That also counts the elements that don't have property P. So then I need to subtract the number of elements that have R and don't have F and also don't have P. And that's what this expression says. This is basically the same thing, but phrased a little bit differently. If I have this term N of R, F, and O, then I can pull a property out of R, shift it into O, and then subtract what happens if I shift it into F. And as the notation with the dot in the cup implies here, I'm only ever allowed to do this for things where R and F and O don't overlap. R, F, and O need to partition all of the properties. Now that we have R, F, and O, we can also be a little bit more specific in which problem gets called the simplified problem. So in this case, let's suppose that the problem is easy. So counting, calculating this function n is easy when r is the empty set, when none of the properties are required. But what we really want to know is n of where all of these properties are required. And let's call these properties 1, 2, 3 in this example. And now I will show you that this rule from the theorem above, we can kind of mechanically apply it in a branching kind of fashion. So let's start with n of 1, 2, 3, empty set, empty set. Now I apply the theorem and the expression is as follows. Let's take the property 1 and move it around. So once it goes into optional, but now I'm counting too much, so I need to subtract what happens if I move 1 into the forbidden set. 
So this is what one step of the theorem looks like. I made R smaller, but it's not empty yet. So this is not the base case. This is not the simple problem yet, and we can start repeating this. Let's do it on the left. Let's take property two, take it out of R because we don't want things in R. And again, we either move it to the forbidden set or to the optional set. Let's do the same on the right. Two either becomes optional or forbidden, but we have to be a little bit careful here because we're doing this to a term that was already negative before. So this entire thing is kind of in parentheses, but we can factor the negation out. And then what we get is that actually this first term ends up being negative and the final term on the right ends up being positive because it's on a path with two minuses. So now on this third line, we have four terms. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, but all of them still have something in R. So this is still not the simplified problem that we can solve. Let's do this again. Let's keep going. Branch the first one, branch the second one, but watch out, that one was negated. So the signs are flipped. Keep going, keep going. So now I end up with eight simplified problems, eight expressions of the first one on the bottom left is n of empty set, empty set, the set one, two, three. The second one is n of empty set, the set three, and the set one, two. And so I have eight of these, and for all of them, r is empty. So all of these are my simplified problem that at the start of this thing, I said, let's assume that we can solve that. So I started with the expression n of one, two, three, empty set, empty set. And now I've turned this into eight different expressions of n, where in each case, r is the empty set. Now here's a question. I think you'll agree that this thing looks like a branching tree, but looking at these leaves, these nodes at the bottom, some of them are positive and some of them are negative. I could, of course, if I actually do branching, I can just remember how many minuses are in there and then I'll know if I have to add it or subtract it. But if I just look at these leaves, if I just look at the sets R, F, and O, I can already see if it's supposed to be a positive or a negative term, if I have to add it or subtract it. Can you tell me how I can see? I'll give you a hint. You should probably look at F. So what you can notice is that the term is positive precisely when the cardinality of f is even, and it's negative precisely when the cardinality of f is odd. And this should kind of remind you of something. And this is actually kind of a proof by branching algorithm that the inclusion-exclusion theorem is true. So let's, let's look at it. So we had n of p, and by definition in our new notation, that's n of p empty set, empty set. And now this branching tree is, it's not a proof, but it's a, a visual argument that n of p empty set, empty set through the repeated application of the above theorem actually equals n of empty set f p over all sets of f where it's negative if the cardinality of f is odd and positive otherwise. Now, if we reverse our new notation and go back to the old n bar, then we get the old inclusion-exclusion theorem, which I think is kind of neat to be able to look at inclusion-exclusion as branching. Because now we have a unified framework to look at both, and we could even make an algorithm that does inclusion-exclusion and normal branching interleaved and does all kinds of cool things. It's not going to be today, but uh, I think we'll see it later in the lecture. So to recap, that's how we just solved the ST Hamiltonian path problem. We have the universe, we have some properties, the actual solution that we want is n of v empty set empty set, so we actually want all of the properties, but our easier problem is n of r of o when r is actually empty, when there are vertices that we're not allowed to go to, there are vertices we don't care about, but there are no vertices that we have to go to. And we can achieve this using the required equals optional minus forbidden branch where we keep moving elements out of r. And it kind of looks like branching, but it's more based on an inclusion-exclusion idea. 
So this thing is called an inclusion-exclusion branch. Let's look at our old friend independent sets and do a similar scheme. So we could do it like this. Problem, counting independent sets, universe, independent sets. And the properties are for every uh, vertex, the set contains this vertex. This looks kind of silly as a formulation, but you'll see where I'm going with this. So what do we actually want? What we want is n of empty set, empty set v. So none of these vertices are actually required. None of them have to be in the independent set. None of them are not allowed to be in the independent set. That's precisely the problem. We don't know which vertices are in the independent set. They are all optional. This is the NP-hard problem. The easier problem is actually NRFO when O is the empty set, when none of the vertices are optional then the problem is very easy. If I know I have to have these vertices, I cannot have these vertices, and together that's all the vertices, then the problem is super easy. I just have to check whether R is an independent set or not. If R is an independent set, then there is exactly one independent set that does precisely this. If R is not independent, then there are no independent sets. Last time we started with everything in R, and that was bad, because we needed R to be empty. Now we start with everything in O, and that's bad, because we want O to be empty. But the scheme is the same. We use this N of R, F, O, and our different properties that we have there to move things around between the required, the forbidden, and the optional set to get from some term that we want into some number of other terms that we can actually calculate in polynomial time. And this time we just ended up with a normal standard branching algorithm. All of the terms get added, there is no subtraction, but you know, um, we all have everything in the same framework now. And with that, let's look at graph coloring again. Given a graph and a number k, is there a coloring of V, a coloring of the vertices, using K colors? Which, as we discussed last time, is equivalent to the question, does there exist a cover of the vertices using K independent sets? And let's now turn this into an inclusion-exclusion formulation. We want a universe and properties. So to start with the universe, we've seen this before, but let's repeat it here. As our universe, we take k tuples of independent sets in G, and you kind of don't have to do it this way, but what we'll say now is that these tuples are ordered. So watch out, that will matter in a couple of minutes. But that's the universe. And then what are the properties? Well, kind of similar to how we did the independent sets on the last slide, but now... It doesn't have to be in the independent set, but it has to be in one of these independent sets in the tuple. And now the claim is, as it was before, that G is K colorable if and only if N of P is strictly larger than zero. Now using inclusion exclusion, we can calculate N of P using two to the N evaluations of N bar of P. And this leads to the theorem, graph coloring can be decided by 2 to the cardinality of p, which equals 2 to the n, queries of n bar. But what is n bar in this case, exactly? We have this universe, we have these properties, and now what is the intuitive meaning of n bar of s for s some subset of p? Well, it means how many k-tuples of independent sets are there that avoid the vertices in s? And last time we had this, this backwards DP for that, but now let's go through a couple of iterations of thinking about this problem and get successively better algorithms. And we'll end up with the same one last time, but I think maybe now we'll understand it a little bit better. So we'll define a function small a of s to be the number of independent sets that avoid s. And now how do we relate n bar of s to a of s? Well, that's a of s to the power k, because we have k separate choices out of a of s possibilities. There is no rule that says that we can't have the same independent set multiple times. So from now on, let's just focus on a of s, and then all the way at the end, we can just take this to the power k and have our real answer. But let's look at a of s. So to carry us over to the next slide, 
Remember, A of S equals the number of independent sets that avoid S. Okay, let's figure out multiple algorithms to do this. Algorithm one, I could just enumerate all of the subsets of V minus S, and for each of them, test if it's actually independent. So what kind of runtime do we get there? Well, it's two to the however large the thing is. So it's not quite two to the n. It's a little bit better than that, because if we have to avoid a lot of vertices, then there are actually fewer subsets of the remaining vertices. So this is O star of 2 to the n minus cardinality of s. And now my question is, if I use this algorithm in my exclusion-exclusion algorithm, what kind of time and space do I end up with? I end up doing this for all subsets of v, and then depending on the subset s, I have this runtime, so then we, if we separate it out by the size of s, and then use our old friend the binomial theorem, we end up seeing that this is O star of 3 to the n. How much space does this take? Well, I just have this entire inclusion-exclusion sum, but each of the terms are independent and I can just calculate them, so there's nothing that I need to remember from one term to the next. So this is actually polynomial space. I can, using this algorithm one for the simplified problem, get a 3 to the n time polynomial space algorithm for deciding k-coloring. Let's now be smarter about this. We had lots of interesting ideas about independent sets and coloring last time, so let's try to do that again. Let's calculate something slightly different. A prime of s equals the number of maximal independent sets that avoid s. And as we saw last week, it's actually just fine to restrict ourselves to maximal independent sets. So rather than trying all sets from being an independent set or not, let's just enumerate all the maximal independent sets of g of v minus s. We've already seen that the runtime of this is cube root of 3 to the power n minus s. We didn't really touch the space of this algorithm, so that's still going to be polynomial space, but now we count these independent sets a little bit more quickly. Use the binomial theorem to arrive at this runtime of O of 2.44 to the n, which is actually the same runtime that we had before from the algorithm from Lawler. But now we have polynomial space, whereas before it was this dynamic program over exponentially many sets. So even here, without improving the runtime from this old algorithm that wasn't the best anymore, we still have the improvement over that using inclusion-exclusion in terms of the space usage. Now let's go a little bit further in time than where we left off last week, and not actually by this much. There's an algorithm by Führer and Kasi Viswanathan from 2007, and it counts the number of independent sets in runtime of 1.13 to the n. To take a small aside, uh, this algorithm actually enumerates satisfying assignments for two satisfiability instances. So 2SAT itself is not hard to decide satisfiability, but it still takes a lot of time to actually enumerate all possible satisfying assignments, um, because there can also be many satisfying assignments. But how does this help us? What is the relation between 2SAT and independent set? Well, um, if I have two vertices x and y and there is an edge between them, well, if there's not an edge between them, then I'm completely fine with whatever they do. But if there is an edge then they cannot both be true. So it, this turns into not x or not y as a clause. And this is a two literal clause. So this, you end up with a two set formula and then you enumerate satisfying assignments. And what you've done is enumerate independent sets. So with this runtime that's better than we had before, we get this theorem, which says, again, we have to go through the binomial theorem, but then we get O of 2.15 to the n, which is significantly better than Lawler, and even better than the 5 and 6 coloring we had last week. So those are now obsolete. You should not do that anymore. You should do inclusion-exclusion. Because if you do it like this, it still has polynomial space. But now let's actually get the runtime down to 2 to the n like last week, but in this framework. So here's my algorithm 4. I compute A of S for all subsets of the vertices using some kind of DP, and this is going to have runtime O star 2 to the n is what I claim now. What would that give me if I have that? Well, then I end up with 2 to the n time, but also 2 to the n space because I need to store all of these A of S. So let's do that. Let's come up with this algorithm. We had this kind of weird-ish 
backwards DP last week, where we kind of had to faff about with what is the set of vertices that I'm looking at, and which one do I need to avoid, and why is my recurrence like this, and it was all just a lot of faff. So now we have our R, F, and O definitions with required, forbidden, and optional properties. So let's actually use this framework to calculate A of S, which is a counting problem. It's the number of independent sets that avoid S. So actually our framework with required, forbidden, optional is precisely suited to talk about this kind of problem. So now my universe is independent sets. And my properties are, is this vertex included or not? And then we quite naturally get to the definition of small a of R, F, O is the number of independent sets that contain R and avoid F, that do not include F. And this actually gives me the real A of S because the real A of S is the A of empty set S, V minus S. S is forbidden, the rest I don't care. Let's think of this some more. What if optional is empty? So if R union F is actually everything, then what is the value of small a of R F empty set? Well, that depends on whether R is independent or not. If R is actually an independent set, then there is exactly one independent set that has precisely these vertices, but if R is not an independent set, then it is actually zero. So this notation here with the square brackets, these are called Iverson brackets, and it's a notation that you sometimes see where you can put a Boolean property in these brackets, and then this expression is one if the expression is true, or it's zero otherwise. So that's what it says here, one if R is independent, zero otherwise. And now if I have R, F, O, and one more vertex, then I can use what we call like normal branching, taking a vertex that's optional and moving it either to required or forbidden and add those two options. And I can use this expression to get rid of vertices in O. I can move vertices out of O into R and F until O is empty. And then I'm in this base case from the second observation where O is empty, and then I know that the expression is either 1 or 0. And I know if it's 1 or 0 in polynomial time, because I can just see, is R independent or not? So this already gives us an O star 3 to the n time and space algorithm to compute A of S. But 3 to the n is not what we were looking for. That's worse than what we already had in polynomial space. So wait a minute, what's going on here? What do we need to do? Well, we can have a closer look at what can actually happen to R and F, because we know that we need to end up with independent sets. So here is our next observation. For R, a subset of the vertices, if R is not independent, then A of R and whatever, whatever is zero, because at some point I'm going to end up in a base case where optional is empty, and then I'm going to see, well, R is not independent, so it's actually zero. So A of R empty, empty is zero, because I could keep branching, but all I'm going to see is zeros, because all of them are not independent. And just to see that things that still make sense, let's look back up there. Yes, when I say A of S is A of empty set S V minus S, then this works out, because the empty set is actually independent. So this is fine. So for any one argument, I know that R must be an independent set. I could now try to say, okay, how many ways are there for R to be independent? And then I have F and O and those partition the rest of the vertices. And maybe I can think about that, but we're going to go in a different direction. Our problem seems to be that we're looking at too many different ways of looking at A, R, F, O with too many different values of R, F, and O. So is there some repeated information there? Let's actually look at two different ways to partition the vertices that are not optional. So I have R1, F1, O, and I have R2, F2, O. And both of them partition all of the vertices. Both of these RIs are independent, because if they're not independent sets, then I already know that we messed up, and it's not going to be anything other than zero. And now my claim is, if 
R1 doesn't have any edges connecting those vertices to O, and R2 doesn't have any edges connected to O, then actually their number of independent sets that contain R and avoid F is actually the same. Why is that? I'll give you a second to think about it. So what we are saying is that if R is an independent set and there are no edges between R and O, then it doesn't actually matter what R is. Then the value of A, R, F, O only depends on O. Given that these R's must be independent sets and that they have no edges to their corresponding O. So now that I've phrased it like this, maybe that helps you think about it. Why is this true? Well, R1 is an independent set, so that's fixed and I can only decide what to do with O. R2 is also an independent set, and the same O is still free and I can do whatever I do there. So in both of these cases, the number of independent sets is as follows. It is however many different things I can do with the vertices in O, and then I can either add R1 to all of them, and we know that we can add this R1 to anything we do in O because there are no edges between R1 and O. Or I can add R2 to all of them. But for the number of independent sets, it doesn't matter if I add R1 or R2. It's the same number. It will be different independent sets, but it will be the same number of independent sets. And that's what we're calculating at the moment. And this number only depends on O. So this second observation, A of R, F, empty set is Iverson of R is independent or not. Let's actually forget about the case where R is not independent because that is a case that we are trying to avoid. So now that observation can be phrased differently, which is that if V is partitioned into R and F, so O is empty, and R is independent, then A of R, F, empty set equals 1. And now we get to the important lemma. And watch out, this isn't the full statement yet. We'll still tweak it a little bit, but let's start going like this. So I have R, F, and O, and those partition V, and then I have a particular vertex that is currently optional. And now I have a new recurrence. It says that A of R, F, O, equals something plus something. What are those two things? The first thing is I take V out of the optional and I forbid it. The other option is I take it, but now I can kind of take some observations about independent sets. If I know that I don't care about sets R that are not independent sets and I take a certain vertex V, then I at the same time can also immediately forbid all of the neighbors of V. So that's what the last line here does. Plus A of R where I add V and F where I add the neighbors of V, open neighborhood of V, so not V itself. And I remove from the optional vertices the closed neighborhood of V, so V and its neighbors. And I apologize for the notation that the neighborhood is now called U, but we already use big N all over the place, so I needed a different character here. So this is some fairly basic recurrence for independent sets now with required, forbidden, optional. But we had this observation before that allowed us to conclude that a lot of things are actually the same if we're talking about independent R that have no edges to O. So let's see what that actually gives us in this recurrence. So first of all, if we're only doing independent R, then clearly on the left A of R, F, O, there R is independent. Then in the second term, R is, of course, still independent. That's fine. But in the third term, we are adding V to R. So we have to be a little bit careful there. Is R union V still an independent set? Think about it. We were already talking about the situation where there are no edges between R and O. If that's true, then in the first term, A of R, F, O, there are no edges between R and O. So then I can add any one vertex from O to R 
and that will be independent because there are no edges to make it not independent. And I actually maintain this property because even though I add V to R, I remove V and all of its neighbors from O. So I also maintain this property in both cases that there is no edge between anything in R and anything in O. So this gives us the actual lemma. For V partitioned into disjoint R, F, and O, and a particular V and O, and R independent, and there being no edges between R and O, then I have this recurrence and I maintain these properties. And then I can use the property from before to realize that in all three of these terms, it doesn't actually matter what R and F are. Whatever they are, the numbers, the value of A of these parameters must be the same. It can only depend on O. Oh, I can actually just drop these things. They do not matter. Whatever I put in there, this equality holds. It only depends on O. So let's give this a name. Let's call it B. And now I have this recurrence. It still needs a base case, and I keep taking things out of O, so the base case should probably be B of empty set. And now here's a question for you. What should be the value of B of empty set? By definition, it's A of some R and some F and then empty set. So we don't know which vertices are in R and which vertices are in F, but we do know that R is an independent set. So how many independent sets are there that explicitly take these vertices and no other vertices? Well, one independent set, specifically this independent set. So we don't know which one, but we don't care. We know that there is exactly one. Whichever one we're actually talking about, that is the one that we are talking about. So the base case is B of empty set equals 1. Now we can make a big table of all values of B, O, for all 2 to the n different subsets of vertices O. And if I do this in increasing size of O, then clearly I can calculate every entry in constant time, and I can just build this table in O star 2 to the n total. So now I have this table B, but what I really wanted to do was have a table for A. How do I get from this B table to the A table? And if we look back at our first observation on this slide, we see that we just have to take the complement of the set, and then this gives us our actual answer, just from the definitions of A and B. So that gives us the theorem that we wanted. We can compute the table with all of the A of S's for all S subset of V in a total of O star of 2 to the n time. Or we could even not make A and could just directly look up into B, but the way that we phrased it before it, it was A of S. And then we did inclusion exclusion on that one. So there we have it. That is our renewed look at graph coloring. Given a graph, undirected, number k, does there exist a proper k coloring of the vertices? How do we do that? We get our inclusion-exclusion formulation for that as a k tuple of independent sets from g with the property this tuple includes an independent set that has every particular vertex in it. And then the algorithm is compute n bar of s from a of s to the power k for every subset of s of v. So that's 2 to the n time to calculate this A of S table, and then another 2 to the n time to compute the inclusion-exclusion sum, and then in total we have that we can do graph coloring in O star of 2 to the n time and space. So what we ended up with here is we can do graph coloring for general K, either in 2 to the n time with 2 to the n space, or with about 2.15 to the n time and polynomial space. This 2.15 to the n actually also made our previous 5 and 6 coloring algorithms useless because now you should just use this general k algorithm to do it for 5 and 6. You can actually do general k graph coloring faster than 2 to the n, but to be perfectly honest, I don't actually know how that works. I think it was Birkeland and Hustfeld who also were the ones to do that, but it's something like 1.98 to the n or something 
it wasn't really that much of a practical improvement, but I mean, just from a theory perspective, it's super exciting that you can do this. It was already exciting that you can do it in 2 to the n for arbitrary k, but now it turns out you can even do it in strictly less than 2 to the n time, which is kind of cool. And that's, I think, about 10 years ago. I'm, I'm not really up to date on the graph coloring literature, so... So if anybody wants to like have a little bit of a look at the literature to see if like anything cool happened, I'd, I'd be happy to hear about it. So this week we didn't really see many new results, but I think that we now have a better understanding of inclusion-exclusion and the way that we're going to be using it. Next week we'll look at more things that we can do with inclusion-exclusion and with branching and how those kinds of things can be combined. I think you'll like it. We have a powerful tool now that can give us all kinds of algorithms just by recognizing that we can do it with like a universe and properties and then juggling things around between required, forbidden, and optional. So thanks for your attention. I hope it was clear and I'll be available for questions in the chat and um, have a good day.